Hello, hello, Scallywags, and welcome back to Bumblebee. Get ready to hit the big blue seas as we count down the top 10 shock pirate traditions in history. A fun one to start us off is how you should never know their name. Pirates and serial killers. They have a couple things in common for sure, mainly being that if we know their name, it means they got caught. And if they got caught, how good at their job were they? In a strange but sensible irony, the pirates whose names have made their way through the decades of history to the present day fall into two categories, very sloppy or authoritarian. A great example of the second is the famous Zheng Yixiao who commanded over 800 ships in a pirate government system that overpowered the seas of China. An example of Sloppy was Blackbeard and his crews. Sloppy pirates names are remembered because they were captured and tried before the admiralty court and then put to death. An authority pirates name is remembered because the government or crown had to barter with them for freedom. The most successful pirates in history will forever remain the most unknown, never caught and living only on paper. Or remain known because their intelligence couldn't be measured by the rope meant to hang them. To follow that up, let's learn about how their strongholds had influence. Ideally, a ship's base was close to the routes taken by the pirates' primary targets and was a place of refuge for the poor weather where their ships could be repaired. Thus, the strongholds. Shipping, docking, and merchant setups full of booty and both kinds of it. These pirate ports scattered around the world. They were hot spots of piracy and criminal activity that shaped the course of history. Pirate traditions and cultures can be found originating in the strongholds. No matter how they differed from ship to ship, the basis of their lawless law came from these islands. They had to have a set of behaviors, and as ruthless and as free as they were, they were respected if you wanted to be able to return. Only a sick dog craps in its own bed. In other words, you don't rob from your neighbors, kill anyone stupidly, threaten people, or do anything crime-wise in your own area. All outlaw groups have this code. Think mafia or like a robber's code. Put any group of people together for a long period and they'll sort out some basic rules. It's what humans do, regardless of the type of group. For example, the Tortuga stronghold in Haiti, pirates branded themselves together in a loose coalition called the Brethren of the Coast, which had its own codes of conduct to protect the island. And speaking of codes, the Pirates Code. Pirates codes were based off of the codes upheld by the strongholds, aka the dog analogy of not crapping anywhere you sleep. If you didn't want it yourself, don't do it to others. Basic kindergarten principles. Pirates code would differ slightly from ship to ship. Certain captains emphasized some rules over others. Meanwhile, while some added their own. The pirate's code I'm going to share with you is a pretty general one and it's written for the crew of Black Bart Roberts ship in 1722. One, rock the boat. Every man shall have equal vote in affairs. Two, be smart, don't steal from pirates. If they want to defraud the company to the value of even one dollar in plate, jewels, or money, they shall be marooned. If any man rob another, he shall have his nose and ears slit and be put ashore where he's sure to encounter more hardship. Three, gambling is for landlubbers. Four, mind the curfew. Five, Keep battle ready. Six, never bring your date home because if any man shall be found seducing one of the latter sex and carrying her into sea in disguise, he shall suffer death. Meanwhile, seven is stand by your hearties. Ironically, that's not about love. It's the whole he shall not desert the ship or his quarters in the time of battle or be punished by death. Then on number eight, settle disputes on shore. Nine, lose a limb, get workers comp. I'll circle back to that in the next, bear with me. And then number 10, remember that rank has its privileges. Captain quartermaster shall receive two shares of a prize. Matter, Master Blaster and Boat Swain, one and one and a half shares, so on and so forth. And last but never least, 11. Give the band a break. The musician shall have rest on the Sabbath day only by right and on all other days by favor only. As promised, circling back to insurance funds, that's right, pirates were better to their employees than just about every major company nowadays. They had benefits. Although experts debate on how democratic pirate groups were, they were surprisingly progressive when it came to the spoils of their enterprises. Insurance, grub, and liquor money were pooled and were were always contributed to from the plunders. The injury fund was also sometimes used to help alleviate financial trouble from a widowed partner of a pirate as well. This meant that if any members of a crew or pirate was injured, they were still able to reap the benefits of a successful campaign instead of just being left on the, the proverbial battlefield. Individual groups charter articles identified the amount of loot to be paid to injured pirates, so spoils were gathered together in the aftermath of an attack, injured pirates all received the amount specified in the charter, and the rest of the group divided the remainder amongst themselves. So let's talk booty and not that kind. 
yet. Resellers of the sea is what I'm calling them because pirates may have been searching for gold, silver, jewels, and rum while plundering ships, but they were also on the lookout for something that was just as valuable. Maps and novels. E.g. One stolen Spanish atlas from 1680 was extremely valuable pirate booty and uh, that overjoyed pirates when they seized it, according to their detailed journals at the time. Kinda cute, overjoyed at a map. Okay, Dora, I see you. It was so valuable, the pirate Bartholomew Sharp printed a colorful map, English version of it, and presented it to the king of England, saving himself from the death sentence. Contrary to popular belief, pirates didn't actually steal that much gold or jewels because the ships that they looted weren't carrying that kind of cargo. Metal is heavy and being on a boat is a fight against gravity, so I mean, be realistic. They generally stole weapons, food, hide, spices, and liquors, which is why they didn't bury their treasure because it's not the kind of treasure that would hold up in value if it's buried in the sand. Turns out books and maps were often worth the most. Everyone wanted them. The aristocrats and nobles and educators would be even willing to buy them from the dirty criminal absconding pirates, meaning books and maps had the largest market. History gives us many accounts of buccaneers pilfering books from seized ships, the most famous being Blackbeard's diary which was stolen after his death. Close your eyes and hold your nose, it's pirate medicine. Ah, nobody I want to take medical advice from more than STD riddled scurvy infected melanoma having pirates. This is because traditionally, pirates never went to shore for medical, whether the flu, scurvy, or a compound fracture, your ass is staying on that boat so somebody's gonna fix it whether you like it or not or how they do it. Yay, traditionalism. It was insanely important that the surgeon was treated well by the crew and the cap. Without him, the entire cruise could be rendered useless. And for example, when Archibald Murray had left the ship of Black Bart in 1720 after a disagreement, no one else knew how to amputate limbs or prevent gangrene. And an attack from a raid left half the crew in need of medical aid. So with no other options, the wounded were given enough rum to lessen their pain and left to die. It became known a good surgeon surgeon was worth their weight in gold, and so captains were known to even compete or, or kidnap them. Surgeons were able to read and write, and they also had the rare knowledge of Latin since all medicine bottles were labeled in that language. Surgeons who plied their tray at sea were often from a lineage of sea surgeons, who long since sailed with the Roman warships, and during medieval times, a companion to nobility. AKA, they were literate, could navigate, and had seen the world desirable. How good were they at their jobs is unknown though, but the equipment they had to work with was pretty medieval, such as the pump clister and the mortar and pestle, or this urethra syringe used to help inject mercury so to help with the effects of STDs. Yikes. Another pirate tradition, talking like a normal person. We've had a bad habit in recent years of glorifying the pirate era and comparing it to the modern progressive ideals we have today. If you watch my video, Top 10 Real Pirate Sea Captains Feared the Most, you'd know that quite a few captains were visible ethnicities, women, or both, as were the crews of most ships. So yes, absolutely, pirates were so much more diverse and cared less about racist and religions than times in history before, after, and happening around them. But don't think there wasn't a lot of xenophobia, sexism, I'm still going around. The strongholds discussed in point two spread between Africa, Asia, America, and the Caribbean Isles. A big mix of people and a lot of accents and languages. Most pirates, despite illiteracy, were fluent in multiple languages and moved far from home. So let's talk pirate accent because the R in the shiver me timber crap is far from accurate and a diverse group of people weren't all saying the same things in the same ways, let alone that cornily. So where'd it come from? Disney. Same people that made y'all think Pocahontas actually runs off with a white man of her own will and they orphaned Bambi in front of all of us and when we were like seven years old. Many of the phrases we associate with pirates originate from the 1950 Disney live action film Treasure Island, based off the 1883 novel. Newton's performance, full of references to landlubbers and booty, not only stole the show, it permanently shaped pop culture's vision on how pirates looked, act, and spoke. And speaking of looks, how about logical accessorizing? These guys weren't dummies. You try to keep a ship afloat. I mean, do you know how to use a compass, bud? Teasing aside, they really were ingenuitive with earrings. So here's how. According to National Geographic, sailors believe that applying pressure to the earlobe would ward, would ward off seasickness. Unfortunately, while piercing your date can help alleviate migraines, earrings in your earlobes do nothing. But cannonballs were accompanied by a loud blast known to deafen people. So pirates would use the hoops to hold wads of wax that they could flip up and press into their ears as a makeshift plug. While fire the cannon. Another use was funeral insurance. Their earrings could be taken, melted, and used to pay for their burial, no matter how far their body washed at sea. Some even engraved the names of their home port on the inside of the earrings so that bodies could be sent for proper burial. Other strategic accessorizing was eye patches, not used for blindness, rather keep one eye adjusted to the dark for trips below deck. And don't forget Blackbeard's notorious power move of braiding hemp in his beard so he could start it on fire and terrify everyone. Also it was hemp burning in his face. From Jamaica. So Blackbeard would have quite literally been flying high. Watch out when you say ahoy matey, it may not be what you think. Acknowledged since the 1600s, Metelotage developed in an environment where crewmates often knew each other more intimately than 
than the wives they'd left beyond on land. In some cases, it was just an affectionate friendship to fill the emotional void. Others, it was fraternal brotherly love. In most, romantic and sensual love. Originally an economic partnership label, one pirate would agree with another that they could inherit the remaining fortune after leaving part of the dead man friends or to his wife. But regardless of the type of metalletage, pirates took the bonds very seriously. In pirate society, two men could join a metalletage and share their all their plunder, even receiving death benefits if one died before the other. Pirate mates would live together, exchange gold rings. Though the bonds of metalletage were respected on board, same-sex unions were highly stigmatized on land. How stigmatized? Well, in Tortuga, Governor Le Versier wrote to France in 1645 requesting the government send some painted ladies to the colony in hopes the presence of more women would curb this issue. However, the plan backfired and some bisexual pirates began marrying the working girls to share them with their also bisexual partners. And last but not least, the shocking ritual of crossing the line. Pirates and sailors were and still are notoriously superstitious people. One of the most common rituals was the ceremony of crossing the line. The first time a ship crossed the equator from north to south during the voyage, everyone on the ship who had never made the crossing was forced to undergo a ceremony of sorts, in which, with great pageantry, they're summoned by Neptune, a pirate in a Neptune costume, and ducked in the sea unless they can pay a fine to escape it. That fine would go towards the actual money pool. The ceremony could also involve play act characters like Davy Jones or Neptune's Bride, mock trials, ritual shaving, and dancing in the evening to celebrate. It was fun, but also deadly serious. Most sailors couldn't swim, ironically, but the ceremony was never forbidden, and everyone from the captain on down was required to pay a fine to avoid participation. Some pirates have rituals that are darker versions of the carnivalesque line crossing pranks. The behavior of pirate Francis Spriggs is reputably some of the most violent and sociopathic of the Golden Asias in 1720s. Captain Richard Hawkins, Spriggs' former prisoner, describes a number of Saw movie-esque games such as forcing captives to eat a dish of candles and tacks, or forcing prisoners to run inside a circle of candles while being pricked by forks, knives, and the sharp ends of compasses and in the backside, which during a violin would play a merry jig. Alright, alright, thank you so much for watching my swashbuckling friends, whatever the hell that means. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Be sure to like and subscribe to hear more. Comment down below what you want to hear more about in the future, and I'll see you next time.